you know that we are now recording. It's my pleasure to welcome Carl Scotland. Carl and I go back over a decade. I've known Carl for a long time through the um, London Agile community. I enjoy his thinking and his writing, and I've always benefited from what he has to say. So it is with my great pleasure that I, Carl has accepted my invitation to come and run a webinar for us. And I'm now going to hand over to Carl. Carl, all yours. Thanks very much, Nada. Um, good to see everybody. Um, looking forward to this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I've got some slides. We're going to do some presentation, kind of introduce some ideas. Um, hopefully, there's a few little bits that, that are a little bit interactive. Um, and then if we've got time and if people have questions at the end, we can we can see if we want to get into a bit of discussion. Um, my my original plan uh, was to have some music playing in the background. Um, and then I was going to ask people to uh, to to tell me what what style and genre of music it was. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get that to work with, the, with Google Meet. Um, so uh, you just kind of imagine that some music was playing and I'd ask you a question. Um, and oh, the uh, I have because I updated my slides at the last minute. Is that is that still sharing correctly, Nada? Yes, it is. Yes, we OK, cool. Um, <laughs> that's a problem with making last minute tweaks. Um, I was going to be playing some lo-fi music in the background, so uh, I have to say I'm 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 not such a, a music guru that I know exactly what lo-fi music is, um, but I, I do listen to this this switched on pop music uh, podcast. Uh, the URLs at the bottom, and they did an episode on on lo-fi music, um, which I found was really interesting and, and kind of relevant. I was already talking about um, this this idea of fidelity, um, but it seemed to to match in. Um, Quite quite directly, and there's this, this, the uh, the definition of lo-fi music. I've just taken a, a snippet from Wikipedia. Um, lo-fi, low fidelity, short for low fidelity, uh, a music or production quality in which elements usually regarded as imperfections in the context of recording or performance are present, sometimes as a deliberate choice. So this idea of lo-fi music, and if you you can go on to you know. Spotify or Apple Music or your your preferred streaming and just type in lo-fi and you know, you'll probably get a bunch of playlists. Um, it's kind of quite chilled out background music, um, but and, and often it's it's bedroom music. Um, it's kind of sort of music people play, make and make in their bedrooms rather than kind of going into big expensive studios. So that's one aspect of the lo-fi. But the thing that jumped out to me from this definition is the idea of um, the imperfections in the context of the recording. Um, so they're not trying to make it perfect. Um, and actually, even sometimes doing that deliberately. Um, and I for me, one of the kind of key points I'm going to repeat is, is the idea of fidelity is not the same as quality. So when we're talking about, and I'm talking about lo-fi music, it's not low quality music. Some of the music is really, really good. Um, it's just a, a stylistic decision to, to make it less than perfect in, in, the, in the way that it's recorded. So I want to talk about that idea um, in terms of agile and, and software development, and what can we take from that idea of fidelity? Um, so starting off with the with the iron triangle, um, this is probably kind of really well known. The idea that um, scope, time, cost, quality, um, the three of those are, are variable. But if you vary one, then the others vary with it. And, and generally, quality in the middle is quality we don't want to vary. But if we if we need to want to reduce the scope of something piece of work, we're probably going to have to increase the time and the cost. If we want to get something done more quickly and reduce the time, we're probably going to reduce the scope and the cost, etc. Um, so usually this is this is an argument, uh, and sometimes it's used as an argument against agile. You know, you can't you can't do these projects where we want to try and scope fix scope and time and cost with agile. Um, and then some people use it for an argument for Agile because, well, actually, Agile, you know, gives a perfect way of, of varying the scope, time, and cost. Um, but I think there's something missing in here. And actually, I, what I found is that with Agile, you can actually fix scope, time, and cost. But you do that through this idea of fidelity. But what I'm doing here, and, and the, the way this works is actually we, we differentiate scope from fidelity. So in the same way that fidelity is not the same as quality, Fidelity is not the same as scope. So I'm I'm redefining scope a little bit here, but scope is really then I think about 
outcomes, the outcomes that we're meeting for our customers, the needs that we're meet, meeting and the value we're delivering. So very, scope is very much outcome focused, I'm not worrying about the details of the implementation. Um, fidelity then is, is around sophistication, precision and polish. So what's the fidelity of the solution? How sophisticated is it? How precise is it? How polished is it? That meets a specific scope or a particular scope in terms of outcomes, needs and values. And uh, this reminds me of, of this quote from Reid Hoffman, so the, the guy that most famously probably linked in, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. I think one of the things he's talking about there is not just um, scope and kind of minimizing scope, but probably minimizing fidelity. So low fidelity, that idea of it's not very precise yet means you might be launching too early, but actually that's the way you get feedback. So as well as looking at when we're building products, as well as kind of going, what's the what's the minimal viable product in terms of scope? What's the the lowest possible fidelity we think we can get away with to get to market, to get feedback, and to start getting getting start getting that learning? So I think my my hypothesis here, and what I'm going to try and argue is that scope, time, cost, and quality can all reasonably be fixed, and you do that by varying fidelity. Um, I put the word reasonably in brackets because if somebody comes up to you and says, can you deliver this big project at uh, you know very little cost by tomorrow um, at high quality, that's probably not reasonable. But for most projects, I think you've got, where you've got a, a, enough flexibility, you can hit the scope so you can meet the outcomes and needs you're looking for. You can do it by a particular date. Um, you can do it by a particular cost. Um, and with agile, time and cost are generally synonymous you have a fixed team fixed team for a certain amount of time gives you that cost and then obviously we're always want to be looking at building qualities as high as possible Carl just to let you know that yeah changing slides we are not seeing them oh okay uh, in that case let me stop sharing I wonder if that's because I unshared and shared again that's interesting uh, thanks for jumping in let me um let me go back to the top try resharing Okay, you seen the first slide again now. Is that coming through? Yes, Carl. Okay, and then does that slide change now? Yeah, yeah it does change. Excellent. Now. Okay, so I'll just I'll just fly through these slides really quickly just to kind of reset the context. So this was the definition of lo-fi music that I was referring to. Um this idea of of um you know imperfection sometimes is choice. Um, with the URL to the podcast at the bottom. Um, the Iron Man travel time triangle, um, scope, time, and cost, um, and, and varying those. Um, that's where I talked about scope and fidelity. So scope in terms of output, outcomes, needs, values, fidelities in terms of sophistication, precision, polish, um, the kind of the nature of the solution. Um, that Reed Hoffman quote, so uh, uh, that embarrassing first product is not just one with minimal scope, it's probably one with low fidelity as well. Um, and then the idea that we, I think we can fix, reasonably fix scope, time, cost, and quality. So I'll dive into a little bit more about, about what do I mean by fidelity? Let's kind of dig into that a little bit more. Um, so the first question, uh, this this idea of the Spice Girls question. So, um, I'll see if I can just flip over and see on the chat. Does anybody uh, anybody know? Put it in the chat if you know what the Spice Girls question is. You can tell me what the Spice Girls question is. Is that something you've come across before? So we got one here. It says, do you really know what you want? Yep, that's the one. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Um, so from the uh, one of the from the first probably biggest singles. Um, this is this is something that uh, kind of got popularized in by Stephen Bungo, I think it was. He kind of talks about it as a, as a really powerful question to ask businesses, leaders, executives, 
um, about focus and prioritization. So it's a good question about, don't tell me, uh, you know, you want everything, but tell me what you really, really want. So um, the counter answer then usually is what I call the queen answer. Um, so does anybody want to know, kind of how to guess what the queen answer is? Anybody put that in the chat? I can't see the chat very easily, so I can't, I'm not sure whether anybody's putting anything in. I kind yeah. of just gave, gave gave the answer a little bit. Sorry, Nada, you want to jump in? There, there was a guess, somebody thinking, is it we are the champions? That's a guess. Ah, uh, it's good. It's a guess. It's it's not right. The, the correct answer is I want it all. I want it all. I want it all, and I want it now. Um, now these these two kind of questions and answers are they're kind of seemingly in conflict, aren't they? Because we're asking people to tell me what they want, what they really, really want, and really focus and prioritize. And usually they want everything. So fidelity for me is a way of of, of reconciling these and bringing them together. So we can look at the burn down in terms of the iron triangle so this is something i picked up um when i when i was first going to agile conferences and ken schreiber was doing a um, speaking at a conference in zurich and he described the the burn down as a way of looking at the iron triangle which i kind of quite like because you've got scope up the side and time so that's two of those um four things so the the, the slope of the burn down itself is therefore a function of cost and quality if we want to make this slope steeper and come in deliver sooner then we need to either reduce cost um, or what usually happens is reduce quality combination of the two uh, similarly if we want to you know re reduce scope i mean you can reduce scope to come in time but um, changing the slope of this line is generally a function of cost or quality fine in theory but one of the things we know is that Brooks Law says that adding people to a late software makes it later. So actually, the longer a project goes on, you can't just throw money at the problem and throw people at the problem because actually it makes it later. Because it's not as simple as that. Um, so that then what people then go to usually is, well, let's cut corners. Let's try and reduce quality. Um, probably from experience, we also know that if you try and cut quality, it's going to cause problems um, and it's going to bring things in later. Doesn't really help. What's interesting with the quality one is uh, Keith, Keith Braithwaite came up with this idea, um, and this was at the this, this same conference in Zurich uh, that Ken Schreiber was speaking at, that actually, if you want to use quality to reduce the slope of the line, to make the line steeper and come in sooner, you actually need to increase quality. So he says, and I kind of made this up, Braithwaite's law from after Keith Braithwaite, um, increased quality increases velocity. So if you have some really good high quality code that's, that's got good coverage of automated tests, that actually allows you to go faster. Um, so it's like the idea that the brakes on the car allow you to go faster, they don't slow you down. Um, so again, in theory, we could play around with quality and notionally we could increase quality to, to burn down more quickly. Um, in reality, very rarely happens. So actually, I think it's fidelity that actually allows you to do that. So I'm going to redefine this and say that the, the slope of the line is actually a function of cost, quality, and fidelity. So we can still keep costs the same. We still have the same team um, and the same number of people on, the, on those teams. We're still keeping quality high, but we just, to, to bring that scope in a little bit sooner, we develop a slightly lower fidelity solution. So the definition of fidelity, to try and reinforce this is, and they took this from Miriam Webster dictionary. Um, there's two definitions. The, the bottom one, the lower one, number two, is, is around you know, lo-fi um, music or lo-fi video audio recordings. Uh, that, so that has to do with faithfulness. So how faithfully is the recording reproducing the original? And a lo-fi recording, which is you know, a, an analog recording on a, on a vinyl disc, is lo-fi because it's it's losing a lot of the, the audio it's kind of quite crockily crackly um so it's not as faithful to the original um and then you've got faithfulness in terms of you know marriage faithfulness it's still faithfulness um and then the the one b is about faithfulness to maybe a book so a uh, movie's director instead insisted on total fidelity of book so all of these are referring to faithfulness when I'm talking about fidelity in terms of software and building a low facility fidelity solution, 
rather than being faithful to an original, what we're talking about is it being faithful to our vision. So we have this idea of what a perfect solution would look, look like. That perfect solution is, is our ideal high fidelity solution. But if we build something which is low, it has a low faithfulness, it's not quite as faithful, it's not as good as we'd like it to be, that's what I mean by a low fidelity solution. It's still high quality, still kind of going to um, kind of repeat that message that fidelity is not the same as quality. You can still build a really well performing um, solution. It's just not as not what we want it to be. So it's that low fidelity. So one way of thinking about this, and I'll come back to this later, um, is, is what's called dimensional planning. Nice, so this brings in a nice little metaphor. Um, and there's, there's again, there's a link to a blog post at the bottom. This was this was out, and these these guys came up with this a long time before I kind of came up with the idea of fidelity. But we're both on kind of trying to trying to um, explain a similar idea. They they have this metaphor of a dirt road, a cobble mode, and a highway. The dirt road is something really basic; it's really minimal. Um, doesn't require a lot of effort to build. Cobble road is better; it's adequate. Um, but it's not perfect and then you've got your highway which is the, the best possible solution it's luxury the dirt road is, is what i mean by a low fidelity solution it does the job it gets you from a to b um but it's it's you know it's not going to take a lot of traffic um it might get a bit uh you know messy when it's when it rains cobbled roads it's going to take a little bit more traffic but it's still a bit bumpy but you can probably go a little bit faster on it and it's not going to get flooded and then the highway um, takes lots of traffic. It's going to take extremes of weather. Um, you're going to be able to travel a lot more faster on it. They all get you from A to B, but you can start off with a dirt road. You know, find out, get some feedback. Do people want to go from A to B? If they do, then we can start building out a cobble road so we can start allowing a little bit more traffic, handle better weather conditions or different weather conditions, and then eventually we move up to the highway. So just talking in terms of you know that dirt road, cobble road, highway is 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 starting to get into this idea of do we do we want to build a low fidelity solution? What's a medium fidelity solution, and what's a high fidelity solution? So hopefully that's kind of giving you an idea of what do I mean by fidelity, and how is fidelity different from scope? Because the the scope here in this this idea of of dirt road, cobble road, highway, that the scope is just getting from A to B. We want a road. Um, You've got a road in all of them. They're just different fidelity roads. So what's that got to do with Agile? Um, I'm going to try and describe some different ways of looking at processes um, and, and tie that back to Agile. So first off, the, the Big Bang approach. So um, Big Bang is where you integrate high fidelity architecture slices at the end. So we've got here architecture up on the, the vertical, scope along the bottom, and the kind of those dotted rectangles um, I kind of think of those as a feature each. So when you're doing a big brand, you build out a bit of architecture, and this is high fidelity. This is it will build out the best database possible that's going to cover the whole scope. Uh, we might build out a, a the best business logic layer that we can that's going to build out that can deliver the whole scope, and so on, all the way up through to you know the user interface, maybe and some APIs. You've got all those really high fidelity uh levels layers of the architecture and then we bring them all together they integrate perfectly at the end and you end up with your your high fidelity solution it's got all the scope it's built perfectly so that's that's an extreme way of looking at it and then you know nobody really does that but we can think of that as, as, a, as a big bang approach the alternative or one alternative then is incremental development so we can think of incremental development as adding high fidelity features one at a time. So we build out the first feature to high fidelity. Great, got that working. Build out the second feature to high fidelity. We've got that working and so on. So we're basically working through the scope, adding features. But each time we add a feature, we add it to the, the maximum fidelity until we've delivered all the features we have our systems. Now, I see quite a lot of this. Um, where you have your backlog, your, your backlog is of features, and you literally, you're working through one feature at a time. When the feature's done, you move on to the next one. You never go back and revisit the first that first feature. So you're literally just adding functional. So that's incremental development. Iterative development then 
then, and this is where we get into starting to build up fidelity. So purely iterative is we, we build all the features, but we build a low fidelity solution first. So this might be our, our dirt road solution. So we now have all the scope, but it's just a dirt road um, product scope. But then we can go back, build out a medium fidelity solution. So now we're at the cobbled road. We now have a cobbled road product. We've got all the scope there, but it's that medium level. And then finally, we work up until we've got the high fidelity solution. So that's iterating. You go back and revisit your features to build up the fidelity of features that you've already done. You're not really adding scope. The system still basically does what it always does. It's just doing it better. And then that brings us to Agile. So Agile starts combining that incremental and iterative. So we're incrementing features and we're iterating fidelity. So we might start out building some features at low fidelity. That kind of gives us our first walking skeleton, if you like, um, starts getting us some feedback. Then we can go back and revisit some of those. But maybe there's only a couple of features that we're going to build out to high fidelity. And this might be our MVP at this point. So we've not built out everything uh, to the highest level of fidelity. In fact, we've not built out all the scope yet. But we can then start going and say, OK, let's add a little bit more scope. And let's build out a couple of those features to the next level of fidelity. And then we might say we're done then. So this could be the point at which we've um, we've run out of time. We've we've hit the time end of the you know the time box. So going back to the iron triangle, we, we've hit our fixed time, but we've also got our fixed scope because we've got we've got some level of fidelity across all the features. Um, we've we've probably got hit our fixed cost then, assuming that we've kept a stable team going through through it, and we've built it to a high level of quality as well. So fidelity, I find a useful way of thinking about what what is agile and how we how do we differentiate between incrementing and iterating. Fidelity is really about that iteration and going back and building up fidelity piece by piece. So that's the way I define agile. It's both incrementing and iterating scope, and we're iterating that scope from low to high fidelity. So that kind of talked about what fidelity is, how it ties into agile and that iteration and, and incrementing idea. So how do we actually do it? Um, talked about this before already. So dimensional planning, this is almost like the, the most basic technique you can use to start incrementing, in, including the ideas of fidelity. And that's just having a conversation when you're talking about um, your planning, um, talking about those three, these three dimensions, they talk about them dimensions rather than fidelity. But you can ask, literally ask the question, what would a dirt road solution look like for this? What would a cobble road solution look like for this? What would a highway solution look for this? Just having those three simple levels of fidelity means you can start negotiating and saying, well, do we need the highway? Can we get away with a cobble road solution? Maybe for this bit of scope, we only need a dirt road for now. So you can start saying, do we need a highway? So a lot of projects, they'll still, even agile projects, they'll still try and build a highway solution for absolutely everything, and we don't need to. So that's your kind of first entry point into to using fidelity, just this idea of dirt road, cobble road, highway, and using that as a way to negotiate um, and a way to think about how you plan. Slightly more um, elaborate way of doing that um, is, is an idea for Jeff Patton that he calls feature report cards, and yeah, very similar. Um, but instead of having those three levels of uh, dirt road, cobble road, highway, you can uh, you, you use your grades. So A grade is your absolutely best, and then F grade is is the worst, lowest fidelity. So grading from A to F gives you a level of fidelity, and then you can have a similar sort of conversation about for this feature, what grade do we need it to be? And then you can ask the question, what grade is it now? What do we need to do? What grade do we want to get it to? And how do we get it between where we are now and where we want it to be? So again, not everything needs to be an A grade feature. We might say, well, we're currently a D. We'd like to get it to a B. OK, so how do we move this feature from a D up to a B? Some features we want A. So you end up with this, this report card on this slide. Again, you've got your features. 
um, across the bottom, your scope, grading across the top, and you can decide. And, and at the end of each iteration or the end of every month or every quarter, you, you know, produce your report card that shows where you are, where the gaps are, where you want to be, and that will help you prioritize work. And again, have that negotiation about if we've got a fixed date, um, what are the most important things we can do to get to a good enough grade? And maybe we need to renegotiate some of the grades. The other technique I like useful is this idea of, of feature injection. Um, so this is um, some of this comes from uh, the blog post at the bottom um, from Liz Care about kind of comes from the, the BDD community. Um, you start off with a vision. To, to deliver and implement that vision, you might have a number of goals that you want to achieve. To meet those goals, you build out capabilities. Those capabilities, you build out features. To deliver those features, you start delivering on scenarios. And then to deliver the scenarios, you, beat, you, you deliver stories. So kind of starting off with, with a big vision and then decomposing that slowly down into, into stories through these different levels of goals, capabilities, features, stories, and scenarios and, and ultimately st um, stories. So the idea of feature injection is effectively to, to meet the vision, the first thing we need to do is decide a goal. For that goal, what's the first capability? For that first capability, what's the first feature? For that feature, what's the first scenario? For that scenario, where's the story? And you inject the story in to your, your overall scope. So you're asking, for that goal we want to work on, What's the first low fidelity capability that's going to help us meet that goal? For that capability, what's the first low fidelity feature that would help us create that capability? For that capability, what's the first low fidelity scenario that would help us to explore that feature? And then that will lead you down into, OK, now what small stories can we create feed, use to create feedback on that scenario? You reject that story. Once you've got that story, what's the next um, story we can inject until you've got a low, good, low, good enough low fidelity scenario? Then you might move on to the next scenario for your low fidelity feature. So rather than starting off with this big backlog and trying to kind of work your way through a backlog and prioritize and um, and and reprioritize and, and add things to the backlog and evolve the backlog, you, you must kind of start with nothing. So you've got this framework and you inject the first story, you inject the next story until you've got a scenario. And effectively, you've inject, injected the first scenario. And then you're injecting features. And then so you're building up from nothing, effectively slicing each level by fidelity. So building up till you get to just enough fidelity, then move on to the next scenario, the next feature, the next capability and goals. Again, fidelity gives you a way of deciding which story should we inject next? Which scenario should we inject next, et cetera? And when are we done? And when are we ready to move on to the next one? So this is compatible then with with record with um, the, the previous example with the, the feature report guards, um, because you can start saying um, you're, you're injecting story scenarios until a feature gets to a good enough grade, and then you move on to the next one. So that also ties in with, with user story mapping. So this is a, another relevant technique. Um, so user stories, as described by Jeff Patton, and this, this is an, an image from his backlog, it, you're creating a two-dimensional backlog where across the top, this is an online down here, are the, the big stories, um, the, the big scenarios that a user is going to go through, and then Below that big story, you've got all the details that to describe the, the, the details of the software you're going to build. Combine that with the feature injection, and you can say, well, we've got a vision, we've got goals, we've got our capabilities, we've got features. The details of the features, effectively, you can order by fidelity. So the top ones are the ones that you're going to build your low fidelity solution. And then as you move down the stories, um, down this axis, you're starting to increase fidelity. And then you can slice across the top here, and this is a very simplistic example because you probably wouldn't take exactly a, a nice, neat slice like that. Um, you can think about in terms of that's your walking skeleton. Your first slice is effectively your grade F product that 
has a little bit of you know in this example we've used all the features but it might not even have all the features in there it might be some of those features so this gives you a way of looking at how do you inject stories to features um, but visualizing it with with the story map idea where you've got two dimensions so uh, some some ideas of uh, some techniques that you can use how they play back into and kind of using fidelity to think through how you do those um, Coming back to the iron triangle, scope, time, cost, and quality. I kind of talk about this as the fidelity, the lost I mentioned, because I think it's it's there. You just can't see it. And but if you twist the uh, the iron triangle on its side, you can just look down the side and you can see. Yes, okay, we can vary scope, we can vary cost, we can vary time, or you know we can keep them all fixed just by playing around with this idea of fidelity. What's the smallest, simplest, least precise thing we can build? which is going to help us meet scope. We can still hit the time, we can still hit the cost, and all the time we're still building it to the highest quality. So the, the three takeaways, though, is the three things you could do is, is when you're looking at your features and building out features, you can grade them by fidelity. So either just through the, the dirt road, cobble road, highway analogy, or give them a grade from A to F and decide, do, does everything need to be an A, or can some things be a B or a C? And what do we need to do just to get them to a good enough level of fidelity? And then once you've got that idea of your features, you can then inject stories. So start building out stories one by one until you get to a good enough level of fidelity, and then stop, and then you can move on. Or ideally then slice releases by fidelity so actually let's go for a whole release for a number of features which are all grade f or all dirt road so you end up with a dirt road release which is made up of a number of different dirt road features um, through injecting stories and then you go through and, and go to the, the cobble road release might add a few more features at that point and start building out some of those so incrementing features and iterating through the fidelity gives you that real flexibility so that when the business or when the customer says right i really need to be done by this date you really maximize the chances of having something done by then um if you want to refer back to um some of this content uh i kind of wrote two blog posts um back in 2009 um, which build on these ideas. So the first one just talks about fidelity in general. Um, the second one goes into a bit more detail about feature injection and story mapping. And then there's a third one there, um, which I just talk about, you know, how do you manage scope and fidelity, et cetera, so that you can hit release dates. Um, so that kind of ties it back, in, into, back into the iron tri triangle. Um, last little quote to finish off with. Um, Lily Palmer was a, uh, I think she was a German actress. Um, I was I was just looking for quotes on fidelity, and obviously most of them refer to being faithful in some way. And I think that's how Lily Palmer was referring to this. Fidelity is a gift and not a requirement. Um, though you don't have to be but um, have to be faithful um, in your relationships. But actually, why wouldn't you? It's a gift. You don't have to do it, but it's a gross, It's just the right thing to do. It's the best thing to do. Um, I think I think fidelity in terms of the way I've been describing it matches as well, you know. And let's get away from requirements. Let's start just building out, building out scope, understanding needs, and looking at different levels of fidelity to start working out towards how we meet those needs. Okay, um, that that's all the slides I've got to run through. Um, so I'm, I'll maybe unshare my screen and then I can I can see people. So let me see if I can just switch back to. Uh, Google Meet. Um, see if I can see if there's any questions or um, Nader, if you can see any questions in the chat. Sure. Thank you, Carl. Uh, just give a minute or so for people to put their questions in. If you've got any questions for Carl, please put them in the chat and I will read them out. Questions or, you know, just any other thoughts or reactions? It doesn't have to be a question. Just kind of, I'm always interested on uh, what people think of this. So, Carl, there's a question yeah. here. So, how do we know 
what's the appropriate level of fidelity for a given brand and customer segment? Um, I'm not sure about specifically kind of brands or segments, but I think that's what that's what you you talk to your customers about and talk to your um, your your product owners or your product leaders about. Um, I, I think generally most will recognize that that not everything has to be perfect. Um, but particularly um, when you get into that negotiation piece. I mean, some of it is not about what's the right answer. It's about how do you use this a way of negotiating and making sure that you're you're one you're you're iterating you you're building something up rather than diving straight trying to dive straight into perfection. Um, but you know when you're getting crunched for for time or cost, how can you make sure that you are delivering something? Um, but I mean, I guess it's you. It's it's sometimes the low fidelity things are around the the, the nice to haves, um, versus you know the core functionality. So the the things that I think of as your um your your crown jewels of your product are probably the things that you want to be higher fidelity. Maybe the things that are just you know um I'm going you know I quite often use login as an example. Does does login really need to be high fidelity? I think it needs to be. It needs to be secure. So again, it's not low quality um, security. Um, but do you need all the bells and whistles of bells and whistles of of multi-factor authentication? Um, again, there's no right answer, but it's it's a it's a conversation I think to have with your your product owners and your leaders. Thank you for that. Just an observe, a thought that came to my mind, and I'm glad you covered it a bit later on. When when you were on slide 17 and showing, you know, agile iterating and incrementing and adding fidelity, mm -hmm. the picture that came to my mind was the value slices in story mapping from Jeff Patton, and I saw that you kind of cover that a bit later on through feature injection and and that. So that those ideas sort of come together. For yes, me, that was good to bring them together. But maybe you can add a little bit more to that. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean the the, the beauty of of story mapping is the idea that it, it it's a two dimensional backlog. So rather than just it, your backlog being a list of things that you're churning through, it it creates some context around it and and allows you to it kind of gives you a way of visualizing to to make those decisions. Um, if I can kind of flip back to that slide. Oh, there you go. Oh, hang on. Actually, no, let's go back to that one because that's the original. So is that is that updated? Sorry, yes, we can yes. see it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can see that. So, yeah. so yeah, I mean, it, you kind of have that conversation and it gives you something to, to play around. It's particularly the way, you know, Jeff does it here. You know, it's just all laid out on a floor. It's very tactile um, and being able to kind of draw those lines and and ask questions about i mean usually this is about you know going back to the, the spice girls questions tell me what you want what you really really want well you might want everything in terms of the the big story but do you need everything in terms of the the details and the fidelity um probably not um if you i mean if you really really do then then you're just going to have to work your way through it till you get it all um but if you don't then where do, you, where do you want to where can you where do you want to make trade-offs um yeah i think i think user story mapping just just having that two-dimensional um and tactile way of playing around with it is is really useful um and then you know and then just talking about what are what are our slices going to be um what's what's the walking skeleton where can we get something that's 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 an mvp what scopes would be within it what features would be an mvp what would be the minimum level of fidelity for an MVP? Thank you for that, that. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. That that makes it clear. Thank you. Any other questions or clarifications or anything? Hello. Hi. Hey, uh, thank you for this session and a quick question. Um, the scope changes, it might yeah. come anytime. That's what 
PR um, teams or the programs what we run, they're ready to accept the changes as and when it comes by the you know end user or the client or the customer. So when we are looking at this dirt road and cobble road and all stuff, uh, how does these changes coming infrequent or any time? How does it impact? Uh, because the three parameters, what we are saying, is fixed now. So how does yeah. it impact? So, so if you're building out your your dirt road solution, um, that's that's your way of getting quick feedback. Um, so if you just you know if you go straight to the highway and then you discover that you you know you've um, you've you've gone to the wrong destination or you um, you didn't realise that there was a, a river in the way or something like that, you've spent a lot of money um, and and missed out on that feedback opportunities. Where if you just build out a dirt road solution first. You, you're going to one you're going to discover problems on the way and that's that learning and that's that's how scope changes is like oh we've discovered there's a river in the way we now need to build a bridge we didn't realize we needed to build, build a bridge before um the sooner you find that out the sooner it means you can you can either move the dirt road to where you need to build a river or maybe it's going to change the way you build the road because you need to kind of ramp up to a bridge or something like that <laughs> potentially stretching the analogy there but does that does that make sense so that that getting that early feedback so that as you move up the fidelity you've got more confidence that you're spending that money you're kind of building that high level fidelity on the right thing because if i mean if you build out the dirt road and nobody ever uses it what's what's the point of building a highway because nobody's going to use a highway if they don't use a dirt road probably Okay. Um, how does it impact the estimations? How do we going to estimate it? Do we need to estimate first the dirt road and then the cobble and then this one all together? How does it impact us in terms of these uh, financials or estimation wise? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the, you're still breaking down to user stories and you're still estimating user stories. Um, so, yeah, you, you would estimate the dirt road, then you'd estimate the cobble road, then you'd estimate the, the highway um at a, at a very okay. simple level um and then and then as you get you're going back to your 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 feedback and learning as you get that learning you, you know potentially you you're going to add new stories so um you're going to realize that to get from a dirt road to cobble road is is slightly different than what you originally thought you add some more stories you estimate those so by the end of the day it's uh that there's it, it's still stories with estimates at the bottom if that's the if that's your way of working Okay, so that means you are suggesting that uh, we first need to uh, take a funky feature, divide them into stories, and these stories are divided into small chunks of dirt road and then cobble and then the and then yeah. the fine finished ones. Is it? That's what we do. Divide them into three three speed kind of a slides, and then we start implementing the dirt road first, and then find out. Or well, some of the dirt roads are not needed now because that's already good. So let's move on to the cobble road and then then the other one, highway ones. Is it? Yes. Like yeah. Yeah. And that's that's I'm that's thinking what... of how are we going to the sorry, how are these teams going to implement it and showcase it is what I'm thinking, because usually they are in under lots of pressure to deliver it a high quality always, right? So mm -hmm. So, so it's it's you know, looking at the, the the user story mapping, I think gives you the way of doing this because um what, what your, your first demo is, is potentially that grade F walking skeleton or your dirt road walking skeleton. You, that's something you can demo and get feedback on. Um, and then you, when you're building out your story map, you're still starting to anticipate what you think you're going to do to build from a grade F to a grade A or to go from a dirt road to a highway. So we're not just building the, the dirt road and not thinking ahead. We're going to still anticipate that. We're just saying this is the this is the only bit we're going to build. We're just we're going to start off with a, a dirt road or a great effort solution to get that feedback so, and to get that learning. Yeah, I think the I, I think uh, I got the sense of it now. Um, however, if you put this into real practical application wise, if you take an e-commerce application, uh, how can we do this? Uh, these uh, three ways of uh, identification 
dirt and then cobble and then highway. I, I mean, it's a it's a it's a conversation. It's a metaphor that you you can use with with product owners or or product managers. Um, so so first off, okay. I guess guess se separating scope from fidelity is first. If is like, let's not worry about what the solution is. What needs do we need to meet? What what's the value? And then okay, how can we how can we meet that value? How can we meet those needs with some different solutions? what would a dirt solution look like sometimes it's just as simple as asking that question what would a what would a dirt road solution look like what would a cobble road solution look like what would a highway road um solution look like um and then it's it's it's, it's a kind of conversation from there then you can start identifying okay well if we're going to build out a dirt road solution that's going to be these stories and for that cobble road solution that's going to be these stories yeah okay right now anyways we are uh, looking in terms of the highest value to be delivered the fastest interval of time we mm -hmm. are identifying the highest value first right so then we are dividing into two, uh, those highest values to be divided into these three uh, areas and then we can present it get a feedback is that what yeah. you're referring to yeah but okay. so so That's i think of thanks yeah and i'd also say value is a property of the feature not necessarily yeah. of the, the the solution so fidelity is not necessarily yeah. value. now now obviously the higher fidelity there's kind of probably an implicit correlation of higher value because you're getting a better solution um but, yeah okay. but the value should be in things of, of meeting a customer's needs and that's that i would say that's to, more to do with a feature than it is to do with a story yeah that's right yeah thank yeah. you so that, and, that, and that comes back to that uh, that feature injection um so I kind of mm -hmm. go back to to here. Um, what the value is in in meeting the goals and the capabilities and the features. Once you get down to scenarios and stories, that's just implementation detail, really. Okay. Thank you. Got. Okay. Thank you. We got time for one more question. Well, here's this question, mm -hmm. NFRs, non-functional requirements and fidelity, how do they relate? Um, so in some ways, NFRs, are to, well, yeah, it depends on how you define an NFR. Um, some NFRs are to do with, with quality, in which case not to do with fidelity. So if it's things, something like, um, you know, availability, we want, we want, three nines availability is a non-functional requirement to me that's a that's a, a something to do with quality rather than fidelity so as you build out your dirt road solution you build out a dirt load solution that still has three nines availability um sometimes i think i, I kind of think sometimes nfrs are actually just still functional requirements in disguise um um, so it, it really depends on on the nuance of the NFR. So um, perform, uh, performance of uh, the um, scalability. That's what I was thinking of again. How many how many users is a system going to support? Um, you could probably argue that both ways. You could say actually no, it 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 needs to support thousands of users from day one. Okay, that's just quality or you could say actually our low fidelity solution only supports um a handful of users then our cobble road solution supports so you could you could potentially take nfrs in terms of how you define low fidelity up to high fidelity so there's it's kind of one of those there's there's no right answer but it's a it's yeah it's probably a good way of looking at it it's kind of like story slicing isn't it um, lots of different ways to, to slice stories into small different ways. Um, you could take some of those story slicing techniques and think about how do we slice from, you know, some of those ideas in terms of low fidelity through to high fidelity. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's all the questions we've had. So all that is left for me to do is to thank you again for giving us your time and sharing your thoughts and learning with us. Thank you very much for that. Appreciated it. That's so if you want welcome. to find out more about Carl, you can find him on LinkedIn. 
and his blog post is Avela Gility. Avela Gility, yeah. yeah. And I'll I'll send you a copy of the slides that you can share with everybody as well. Thank you. It's, it's got all the, the links and references on there. Thanks very much, Carl. All right. Just Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.